what I'm going to talk about this morning, um, if, you're listen, if you're watching on the internet or you're listening to this in your van somewhere and you're, you're, a, like a, you're a soccer mom and you're driving your kids around and you happen to be listening to this sermon somewhere in the future, uh, this is probably going to be something that you're going to want to skip ahead to the next sermon or whatever, unless uh, your kids are fine or they have earphones on or something and they're not listening to it. So I just want to give you guys a heads up. This is kind of PG-ish. 13-ish, 17-ish, somewhere in there, okay? So you're going to have to make your own call on that if you're listening to this or watching this online. Uh, But we are going to take a look at God's pure plan for your sexuality, that God has built you a sexual creature. Sometimes I find it funny that the church never wants to talk about this. This is the most contested, problematic issue in every single marriage. This is the most contested issue even when it deals with homosexuality in our culture, right? This, the issue of your sexuality is not minor. It's not like, oh, let's not talk about that. That's not churchy or that's not whatever. Hey, guess what? The Bible, the most common, the most common subject in the whole Bible is sex. From the beginning of Genesis to the end of Revelation, it's either the good use of it or the bad use of it. It's either any, the whole Old Testament is packed with examples of people that screwed up. So if you're like, I really screwed up in that area, join the stinking club, Okay? (laughs) If you're like, you're going to talk about some perfect land where no one exists, I'm not going to talk about that land. I'm going to talk about the real world of you and I, okay? But we're going to talk about it in a sanctified, holy way this morning, okay? So my thing is, if you've been in church a long time, you're like, why do we even need to talk about these things? We need to talk about it because it's in God's word. And we're going to take a look at that starting in Ephesians 5, okay? Ephesians 5, verse 31. We've been taking a look at family matters, and this, this day we're going to talk about God's design for sex, And actually, Paul talks about it uh, when he writes to the church at Ephesus in chapter 5. He's writing all these things. Wives, submit to your husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. So he's talking about not a value. Wives are not below their husbands. They're not below their husbands of value. They're just below their husbands in leadership. There has to be order in your home. You can't have a bunch of generals running around any more than you can have your kids thinking they're running the home. Everybody has to line up under authority. The husband should ideally line up under Christ, and the wife lines up under her husband, and the children line up under their parents. And so it's not a matter of value, or it's not a matter of intelligence, it's just a matter of order. So Paul talks about the order of the home, similar to every organization or every functional thing in the whole world that has an organization to it. There's a a top down, not value, but just in role, just to keep organization. So that's what Paul's saying in Ephesians 5. Then he gets to this in in verse 31, and he's going to quote quote Genesis 2, which we're going to look at. And this is the one verse that that we're going to jump out of today. This is going to be our foundation verse. In verse 31, therefore, Paul's actually making a point about the church here that we're all one body of of Christ. But then he, he, he quotes out of Genesis chapter 2 to make his point. Ephesians 5.31, therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Can you believe what I just read to you? I just read to you how every person joins this world. I just read to you how you got here. I just read to you God's plan for sexuality. God built you a sexual creature. For many of us, we try to downplay that and go, oh, it's kind of not godly or whatever. Wow. Anything that God creates and sanctifies by his power is good. Everything. So when God designs men and women to be sexual creatures, even though there's perversion in that area, that doesn't mean that there's not a good example of that. That doesn't mean we just throw away everything. Okay, so everything that's happened in our lives or everything that, that we, have, we struggle with in our lives, understand this. There's a good side to what, the way you're built and there's a perverted side to the way you're built. So if we look at the way God has built us, we have a good path to run down. If we look at the way the world is telling us, hey, just do whatever you want, then we have a totally other path to run down. But God in the beginning says, I create men, I create women, they're both equal in my sight, they're both created in my image, unlike all the other animals, the trillions of animals and insects I've built in the world. I have built this man, this woman, they are to be united sexually, in fact, that's how the world is going to propagate. I'm not even going to get another person on the earth unless they get together. So God has built this beautiful, good gift to happen between you and your spouse, if you're married, or if you're single, 
in the future, there's going to be an aspect to your relationship that God has built just for you. Let's look at it in Genesis chapter 2. Turn all the way to the front of your Bible. First book, Genesis chapter 2, 23. This is actually the story that he just got, Paul just got done quoting. Look at how beautiful this is. This is the very first wedding. I've done many weddings, and uh, sometimes this even gets read at weddings. But this is, this is Adam's song. This is actually poetic in the Hebrew. And he, he probably, imagine Adam probably ripped, just like yourself, Adam, naked, the perfectly chiseled man, standing in the garden. No sin, no perversion, no weirdness. He's been built by God. God has breathed. It says when he, when he built him uh, out of the clay, out of the earth, it says that God breathed his own eternal life, his image, into Adam. And it says that Adam became a living being. And imagine coming from the dust and having blood coursing through your veins, and now you are, a, you are a, a, an ideal creation of God. No sin. There's not been a helper found for you. God has actually built Adam to need a helper to actually even propagate the species. He's built him. He didn't build him asexual. He built him, he built him to need someone else to even have children. But there is none. So he takes some of Adam's DNA and he builds Eve. Thus, making the the point that Eve and and Adam are not ever to be separated. They are actually built for one another. They are built to be complementary to one another. So one's not below the other. They're actually different creations of God, but both in the image of God. And look what Adam says about this. Verse 20, so we'll start in verse 22, Genesis 2, 22. And the rib or the side that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, this is at last, bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Verse 24, and this is what was just quoted. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And verse 25 is so beautiful, which we will never return to in this world. And the man and his wife were both naked, and they were not ashamed. You know why it's cool for little babies to run around naked? But it's not cool for you to run around naked? (laughs) Babies at the water park toddle out in the water. When you start taking your clothes off, and you're running around in public in the water, the cops go, get on the ground. You know why there's a differentiation there? Is because we, in our minds, can't process purity. We will never return to a point in our, in, our, in our lives because we are hindered by our own sinful nature where we can process the purity of God's original plan. But, watch this, through marriage, you can still access this beautiful gift of God. Outside of marriage, you will actually hinder the gift of God in your life. And watch as, watch as we walk through this. So I, I'm laying the foundation, right? We're going to build the house. I just poured the foundation. You're built to be a sexual creature. The gift you have inside of you, the drive you have inside of you is good. It's given to you by God. You're chemically built to be attracted and to have sex with, with your spouse. It's a good gift of God. Watch this. Number one. Number one, God's design for sex. I want you to understand this. It's special. You're going to get many voices in our media or videos you watch or the pornography that you're addicted to that's going to say, sex is just like shaking somebody's hand. Let me tell you something. I've never felt guilty about shaking someone's hand. Okay? It's not just some physical connection with another person. Okay? No, there's not a society in the world that you can walk up to and you shake somebody's hand. I've been in good chunks of the world. And every time I've stepped off a plane, and whatever, whatever they do in their culture, they do, you know, they do the, the kiss on each side if you're in the Middle East. Most cultures in our modern society, you shake, shake, shake somebody's hand. No one has ever punched me in the face or I've never been arrested for lewd act by shaking someone's hand. But I can tell you something, if I walked off the plane and just started taking my clothes off and ran to the nearest woman, 
I mean, nobody in that culture would go, oh, it looks pretty normal to me. That looks fine. I don't really understand what's going on there. There is an element to sexuality for every culture that tells you instinctively that it is special. It is not just a physical connection with another person. It is, there's something special about it. And it's because it's created by God to be special. So watch. As your job and my job with the sexuality God has given us, it's our job to protect it. You must protect the specialness of sexuality in your life. God is the architect of sexuality and has built men and women to be attracted to one another in the deepest emotional, physical, and spiritual bond through their sexual union. I want you to turn to Song of Solomon. <laughs> oh, you guys better buckle up if you've never read this book. I'm going to tell you something. You ready? You hold within your hand one of the most erotic uh, books in the history of the world. Okay? Um, you will not find many daily devotionals that deal in this book. <laughs> There's the reason when you turn to uh, many, you know, uh, Bible reading things, they don't quote out of Song of Solomon because teenagers go, wow, the Bible is intense. And Song of Solomon is a poem, is a song, is, was meant to be acted out as a song. It's like almost like a play. It's an ancient Hebrew play that there are many different parts. There's many different singers in this, in this poetry, in this song, in this play. But I want you to understand this. This is from almost 3,000 years ago. This is sanctified sex. This is sanctified sex. So watch this. Men and women are built to be together. And she is going to speak about it right here. The female in this, in this, uh, in this part of the, of the song, they have not gotten married yet. This is the very beginning. They have just started to notice one another. And, and the woman in this song is going to be starting out right here in verse, uh, in verse 2. We'll start Song of Solomon chapter 1 verse 2. She says this, she's looking at him. She's viewing him from, from afar or from across the room. Pretend you're at Starbucks or whatever. She says this, let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth for your love is better than wine and your anointing oils are fragrant. Your name is oil poured out, therefore the virgins love you. And this is an ancient Hebrew way of just saying all the single ladies. <laughs> love that fine young man. So when the ancient Hebrews would talk about virginity, they're, they're automatically assuming that it's a single woman never been married, okay? They're just assuming it's no wonder all the single women look at you and they go, oh. just let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth for your love is better than wine. It's no wonder the young ladies go after you. Verse 4 the desire of her heart, draw me after you and let us run. And the king has brought me into his chambers. Understand that, uh, that the attraction that is happening here is going to go both ways. I want you to turn, uh, actually skip down to verse 12. Uh, chapter 1, verse 12. It says, while the king was on his couch, this is the reclining chairs that they would have. The nard gave forth its fragrance, and so women would anoint their skin with, with oil, kind of like ladies do when they go to a spa. My beloved is to me a sachet of myrrh that lies between my breasts. My beloved is to me a cluster of henna blossoms, and it's the beautiful um, uh, Middle Eastern uh, huge, like those crocus flowers. My beloved is to me a, he a cluster of henna blossoms in the, vine uh, in the vineyards of En Gedi. And he says this to her in verse 15, Behold, you are beautiful, my love. Behold, you are beautiful, and your eyes are like doves. Behold, you are beautiful, my beloved, truly delightful. And our couch is green. The beams of our house are cedar, and our rafters are pine. And, and she's saying this last little piece to him, saying, I would love to be with you. I would love to be married to you. The word it, that says right there, our couch is green. It literally means our couch, our bed is al alive. It's the word that means, you know, for, for many of you, like your sex life doesn't have a lot of life to it. 
She's saying right here, our bed, the, the bed that I hope that we have someday, is just, it's alive. It's like green. It mean, in some of your translation says verdant. It means like, like a growing, like a living thing. So there's massive attraction between these two, this young man and this young woman. In contrast to sexual, uh, animal sexuality, human sexuality is physical and spiritual. You ever wonder why you have guilt in your life from your past sexuality? Because it's spiritual. My dogs and all the animals I've had, never once do they get up in the morning and they go, I shouldn't have done that. <laughs> I've never heard them. I've never, my, my boxers, my, you know, my dogs at home, they never have a guilty look like, they never look down at the floor and they're like, you know what, that was really dumb, I shouldn't have done that with that fine dog next door or whatever. They never do that. You want to know why? Because human sexuality is physical and spiritual. Here's, watch this. Where the rest of the animal world is primary procreational, they're just driven to that by their, by their, by their, the, the animalistic needs to just procreate. Humans are built not only to be attracted, but once you have sex with someone, you are actually becoming spiritually connected to them, which is why you can't let go of that, which is why those memories stay with you for your whole life, which is why all of us in some degree have regret from our past. And I want to point this out to you. It's one thing to be attracted to someone. It's actually another thing to act on it. Attraction does not equal action. It's the same thing once you're married. You could be attracted to someone else that's not your spouse. It doesn't mean you go, oh, I'm, I'm attracted to them, so I think I'll just go after them now. Because here's the thing. If you do not learn to control your passions, the, the right attraction that you have to the opposite sex, if you don't learn to control that and confine that, then actually what you're doing is you're damaging yourself spiritually because you're connecting with another person on a spiritual level. It's not just physical. It's not just shaking somebody's hand the way the world wants it to, to make it seem. Hey, just use a condom and everything will be okay. Hey, go on birth control and everything will be all right. It's not going to be okay. There's no condom that will save you from a holy God. Where's the condom that will protect you from a holy God? There isn't one because it's spiritual, not physical. But right here, we see the purity of attraction. You are viciously good looking, and so are you. We see these two wanting to be together, which is good and righteous and holy. And watch how they handle it. Sexual attraction and action is connected to morality based in the image of God and is designed to be harnessed within the boundary of marriage. Sex is special like nuclear power, when under control, it blesses people. When out of control, it destroys lives. Isn't that true? Your sexuality is just like nuclear power. Under control, it'll power a whole city because the reactions are under control. Out of control, it's a nuclear bomb, right? We drop it out of planes to blow cities up, right? Nuclear power under control, it's a strong force, but under control, man, it can bless you, right? Under control, your sexuality will bless you. It'll be one of the greatest things in your life. Out of control, like the world wants you to be, just go with whoever. Go, however you feel, be happy. You know the weird thing about it is even the people that tell you be happy, don't worry, be happy, are some of the most miserable people on their second, third, fourth marriage, or they're just living together now. And you know the funny thing about that is even kids that are born in that kind of scenario, even they wish mom and dad were still together. Their original parents were still together. God has built you to be together. God has built you to build confines around your sexuality. Inside of the God's boundary, it will bless you. Outside of it, it will damage. It's the way God built it. Because your sexuality is not just physical, it's actually spiritual. The Bible acknowledges the power of sex, but always promotes it within marriage. Number two. So number one, sex is special. Don't think for a moment that the sexuality you have is not special. And number two, it's good. This is going to be a little tough. Because for many of us, the sex uh, that's gone on in some of our lives has not been good from the standpoint like we felt bad about it, we felt guilt, we felt dirty. It, it feels like kind of that back room kind of feeling like let's not even deal with this. But I, wanna, I want you to see God's original plan for it. God had a beautiful plan when he created your, your sexuality. And it's good. So it's special and it's good. Watch this. God created Eve because it was not good that Adam was alone. At the first marriage, God made their relationship good 
and the first command was, have a lot of sex. We looked at it last week, Genesis 1.28, what's the very first command of God to his, to his two naked, beautiful people? Be fruitful and multiply. Could there be a better command? That's a command from God. That isn't like if you guys just feel like it whenever you get around to it. He's like, let's get this thing cracking. You know the funny thing about the, the, the story of, of creation, you know the funny thing about that? Is God, it says, he builds everything. He builds the whole world, puts oceans in it, lifts up the continents so there's dry ground, gives stars, sunshine, uh, gravity to hold the whole universe together and all the planets to revolve. And you know what he does? He pa- it says he packs the ocean with fish. Instantly the ocean is full of fish. Instantly, the ground is full of animals. You know the only thing he didn't build like that? You know, the, he didn't put billions of people on the earth. You know what he did? He builds his one man, creates a woman out of, him, out of him. The two of them together are built to fit together sexually. And now he says, let's get it on. <laughs> we got a whole planet to fill. He goes, be fruitful and multiply. Imagine that. He doesn't tell the very first couple, I want you to pray. Get together, have some quiet time. (laughs) Well, he did tell them to have some quiet time, but it's not spiritual quiet time from that standpoint. You know what's interesting to me? It's because sometimes we put sex like, if if it's been bad for us, or if that's that's a regret of ours, we we try to like not deal with it, we just throw it away, and we go, I'm not like that, I'm not like that, sex isn't really important to me, or I'm not a sexual creature, blah, 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 blah. So we we try to like, uh, I just got regret, I don't want to think about that, don't want to do do whatever. And the other side is like, Oh, I'm a sexual creature, and I can't control myself, and I, I just need to do whatever I need to do. Kind of like an, it's animalistic to us. In the middle is what, how God created it. God created you with a healthy sexual drive that's special, and it's good. In the very beginning, God says, have as much sex as you possibly can. Make babies. Let's pack this place. You Watch this. You and I are here today sitting in these seats because Adam and Eve said, let's do it. Do you realize that? You and I are actually in that verse. When God says, be fruitful and multiply, you and I and the billions that have come afterwards are part of that command. We're here today because Adam and Eve obeyed that. But I want you to see, sex is good. God built it. You're meant to be together. Even after sin, the marriage bed was designed to be a picture of the pre-sin Eden, a man and a woman naked, not ashamed, engaging in the good gift commanded by the God who made them. Watch this. This is going to, this might blow your mind. Ready? When you're together with your spouse in your bedroom, okay, and the lights are on or off or however you like it, probably off. When you're alone in your bedroom with your spouse, in your bed, naked, that is a picture of pre-sin Eden. You are actually, when you engage in the sexual act with your spouse, you are actually rewinding the clock to the best part of humanity, which was pre-sin. They were naked, they were not ashamed, they were together, there was no guilt, there was no weirdness, they were together in the garden enjoying what God had given them. Isn't that amazing? Are you not amazed? Because sometimes some of us think, oh, the sex is dirty or we don't want to deal with that. Hey, you know what? The original design was totally good. There was not supposed to be any guilt connected to it, no perversion, no weirdness. The original plan was it was good. And to this day, it's still good as long as you do it God's way, right? If you do it God's way, it's still good. There will never be a time when you have sexual contact with your spouse in the privacy of your own home or wherever you like to do it as long as you're alone and the kids aren't there. Like, why, why are you in the pantry, mom and dad? <laughs> Let's make, sure the, make sure the kids aren't home. I don't care where you have sex. Just do it somewhere legal and alone. <laughs> but every time you do that, listen, your marital bed, you are rewinding the clock to pre-sin. The purity of what God originally built, the goodness of what God originally built is yours in your room. No guilt, no regret. There's never been a day in the 20 years I've been married to Julie that I've gotten up in the morning and gone, shouldn't have done that. (laughs) 
you know, the guilt that some of us have carried along with us, uh, you know, from our teenage years or whatever, and you just feel that guilt and that, uh, and that disgusting feeling, that like dark, it just, it's just, it's like, it feels like garbage in your heart. And you can't figure out why, because like people just told you, just wear a condom and everything will be fine. And you just go, this is not fine. I don't feel fine. This feels, I feel disgusting. You know what's weird? Is inside of marriage you do the exact same thing. There's never been one day of regret. I never have one thing from God that goes, don't do that, don't do that, don't do that. And this is the reason. The original gift is good. When you do it God's way, it's all good. It's all good. Because you're actually rewinding the clock before sin. The way God originally intended men and women to be. Virginity until marriage was designed to be the ultimate gift to each spouse on their wedding night. I want you to turn to Song of Solomon 4. So keep your finger in Song of Solomon 4 as, as, as we move through this. Song of Solomon 4, verses 1. So now he is going to speak to his, his future wife. Uh, they have not yet consummated their, their, their relationship. He is now going to speak to his, to his wife, to his future wife. Behold, you are beautiful, my love. Behold, you are beautiful. Guys, take a hint from him, okay? Speak to your wife in these kind of poetic ways. Behold, your eyes are like doves. I wish I had a good Barry White voice. Oh, girl. Oh, girl, you're looking. Okay, I can't do it. Behold, you are beautiful, my love. Behold, you are beautiful. Your eyes are like doves behind your veil. And it's the, it's the ancient Hebrew way of, of women with modesty. They would not have a veil kind of like the, the burqas, uh, the, the, uh, the uh, Muslim burqas, but they would actually have just a veil. It's exactly like we do in most weddings where wives wear veils. You can see their face. They look beautiful. It's, a, it's, a, it's a, just a recognition of modesty. Your, your eyes are doves behind your veil. Your hair is like a flock of goats leaping down the slopes of Gilead. And for many of us, are like, please don't call my hair goats. But, <laughs> but here, again, this is an agricultural picture of when you wa- look at the mountains and the, and, the, and the huge herds of black goats would come down there flowing down the mountains. And it's his way of saying, in an agricultural society, your hair is just is black and it's beautiful. Your teeth are like a flock of shorn ewes that have come up from the washing. So she actually has white teeth. Isn't that nice for her? (laughs) All of which bear twins. I love this. This is so hilarious. All of which bear twins and not one of them is is lost among its young. It's basically meaning she has a whole rack of teeth, (laughs) which is awesome. That's great. I just love, I love this playfulness inside of this. It's like saying, your teeth are like, are like shorn ewes, meaning like the sheep that are shorn, they, they have, they're bright white and they're clean. They, they get rid of, we looked at when we looked at that God is our shepherd, uh, sheep have no ability to clean themselves. You know, they're just like Velcro that everything sticks to uh, as they walk through brush and whatever, and it actually takes a shearer to shear the sheep, but after they're sheared, they look just bright white. So he's saying your teeth are like bright white, and none of them are like, are missing. You know, she has like, she's not like one, a one-tooth woman or whatever. So he's talking about her beauty here. So verse 3, your lips are like scarlet thread, like a scarlet ribbon. And your mouth is lovely. So he's staring at her face, and he's kind of working his way down. So he's like looking at her hair. He's looking at her eyes. He's looking at her teeth. He's looking at her mouth. It's like, it's kind of like beautiful, um, like I don't even know what lady, you know, like the evening lipstick that the ladies put on, like not the uh, lip gloss or whatever. Uh, I'm totally stepping out because I have no idea what I'm talking about right now. <laughs> but it's, it's, the dark, it's that dark red lipstick, okay? It's, it's the deep reds of evening wear or whatever, okay? So he's describing her lips here. Your lips are like a scarlet thread and your mouth is lovely. Your cheeks are halves of pomegranates behind your veil. Your neck is like the Tower of David built in rows of stone. And so he's talking about her stateliness, not that she has like a neck of stone. But he's actually talking about the, the, the fact that, that her, her, the way she stands, the way she is, is just beautiful elegance. Verse, uh, and on it hang a thousand shields, all of them shields of warriors. Your two breasts are like two fawns, twins of a gazelle. Can you believe that? He's working his way down. He says, your breasts are like young little fawns running around. They're like perky little lively fawns. And I'll move on from there. 
that graze among the lilies, verse 6, until the day breathes, meaning the, the, the dawn breathes. It's a beautiful poetic picture of as the morning comes. As the day breathes and the shadows flee, I will go away to the mountain of myrrh, to the hill of frankincense. You are altogether beautiful, my love. There is no flaw in you. Come with me my, uh, from Lebanon, my bride. Come with me from Lebanon. Depart from the peak of Amrana, from the peak of Sinir, from Hermon, from the den of lions, from the mountains of leopards. So in this view, he's, he's looking at her as like my future bride. You have captivated my heart, my sister, my bride. And so this was the f familial way of, of 3,000 years ago of saying, my wife is to me so close to me, she's like my own sister. In our cultures, we kind of separate families. But in ancient cultures, they were together. So, and, and, and that's still celebrated in many cultures. Uh, Hispanic cultures, Indian cultures, many of them multiple generationals living inside of homes. And so that's what he's saying here. Verse 10, how beautiful your love is your love, my sister, my bride. How much better is your love than wine, the fragrance of your oils than any spice. Your lips drip nectar, my bride. Honey and milk are under your tongue. The fragrance of your garments is like the fragrance of Lebanon. And Lebanon was like uh, this beautiful forest. I love verse 12. A garden locked is my sister, my bride. Virginity is at a premium. I love the way he speaks about this. Actually, it's even in a modern song. We have songs that talk about this, a locked door on a candy store, stuff like that. We have, we have music that still talks in this, in this way, that for young ladies, virginity, and young men, virginity is your greatest gift you could give your spouse. Because what that means is, watch, because for many of us, that's, that hasn't been true. If you were able to give your virginity to your wife, to your husband, that means there's nobody in your past, you don't have any baggage you're bringing into your marriage, there's no bad, there's no bad memories or, or whatever. If you, if you got married when you were a virgin, your first memories of the most intense connection you can ever have with another human is of that person. And there's a beauty in that. The world downplays virginity like something to get rid of like 40 year old virgin or whatever. You know, it's like we need to get rid of that. It's like a cancer that's been a part of your life. No, it's actually the be most beautiful gift you can give another person. Because it's spiritual, not just physical. And so when he says to his future bride, you are a locked garden. I love how he, how he, how he presents this. It's like he's looking over the gate going, I wish I could go in there. It's the longing of a lover. It's the longing of a lover that doesn't step past his boundaries, but is making his intent known. You understand what I'm saying? He doesn't go, you're a lock garden that I'm going to kick the door down. Because <laughs> you are a lock garden, my sister, my bride. He is appreciating her virginity while still appreciating her beauty. Not taking advantage of either one. Verse 13. Your shoots are the orchard of pomegranates with all its choices, fruits, henna and nard, and then he goes on to, to describe these, these scents. Nard and saffron, calamus and cinnamon with all the trees of frankincense, myrrh and aloes with all spices. And he speaks about her sexuality. He says, a garden fountain, a well of living water, flowing streams from Lebanon. He cannot wait to have sex with his future spouse. Verse 16. Awake, O north wind, and come, O south wind. Blow upon my garden. Let its spices flow. Let my beloved come to his garden and eat its choicest fruits. Wow. He describes her body as a garden. And then she says, come and eat some of it, big boy. <laughs> I love it. And verse 5, talking about the consummation of their marriage. Verse 5, verse 1. I came to my garden, my sister, my bride. I gathered my myrrh with my spice. I ate my honeycomb with my honey. And I drank my wine with my milk. And then this is like a chorus. Imagine, this, imagine seeing this play. This is like a chorus of people behind the two of these lovers speaking to one another. And they say this. Eat, friends. Drink and be drunk with love. He's saying, enjoy each other's bodies to the greatest amount you can because you have waited for one another 
You have waited for one another. You protected the, the sexual gift that God has given you. Now, now the door to the garden is open. There's nothing that will hinder you. God won't hinder you. Nothing will hinder your sexual enjoyment of one another. It's a good gift from God. Sex is neither to be worshipped, like in our society, nor ignored, like most of the church history, but viewed as a good gift from God to be cherished, explored, and protected. Have you protected your garden, people? And if you didn't protect it before you got married, now that you're married, are you protecting it? Because we protect things that are valuable to us, right? 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 We lock the door at night, theoretically. Right? If you got gold, you go put it somewhere in a safe, you lock it up. But for many of us, our sex life is like open, is like open game. Many of us uh, young singles are just like, if the right person came along, who knows what can happen. For many of us married people, it's like, I don't know, if somebody better came along, maybe I'd try it out with them. No. The sexuality that God gave you that is supposed to be rightly for your spouse must be protected. You protect things that are valuable. You put, a, you put a seal and a lock around that thing that no one else can get in except your spouse. Your spouse should have the only key to your sexuality that they're, they're the only one that can access. And that goes for the internet. You know, one of the biggest users of dating sites are married people. And some of you guys are on there. And I'm telling you right now, I rebuke you. You get the heck off there. If you're, if you're doing anything outside of your marriage right now, I don't care if, you, if you're a flirt, I don't care if you're really lonely or whatever, you do it God's way. God has given you sexuality. You didn't create it yourself. You didn't find it in the woods and go, better not let God know about this. Because he might put a damper on it. Guess what? God has given it to you as a gift. But many of us just give our gifts away like this free candy at Halloween. The garden or the, the picture here that's created is it's, it's locked until a proper time. When the proper time is here, you open that thing up and go, let's get our party rocking. But I tell you what, once that party started, you lock that thing up. No one else gets in. Not internet fantasy women. Not some guy at, on a dating site. Not some guy at work. No one gets in. Not in your mind, not in your heart, not in your body. No one gets in. You build a wall around that thing and you don't let go. That's how God built your sexuality, to be beautiful, to be good, to be special, to be only shared with another person, and that, and that person alone. Number three, it's special, it's good, and it's pure. Are you ready? Your sex life, if it's inside a marriage, is totally pure. It's totally pure. If you have a, a, a corroded mind, from previous experiences, guess what? Guess, watch the beautiful, the, the ability of the gospel. I'm going to bring the gospel into your sex life. You ready? The good news of Jesus. You want, you want to know what Jesus does for your sex life? He can actually purify your mind. There isn't any, there's no counseling. There's nothing in this whole world that can get rid of the baggage that we all carry around in our heart and our mind from our past experiences. There's nothing except Jesus. Jesus is the only one that can purify your mind. If you're willing and you repent of your sin, God actually, all the garbage that I brought into my, my you know, I learned about uh, sex from, from pornography. I learned, I learned about sexuality from hardcore porn uh, in magazines. Because I grew up on a resort where all the guys, when they would come up and spend time at our resort, they would bring all this pornography with them. And I was, I was almost preteen. And so, when they were done with their pornography, they were leaving to go back to wherever they were from. They would throw it all in the trash. And guess who took the trash out? That was my job. And days I'd just pick up the trash and all of a sudden, just filth poured out. And the things that you've seen, you can't unsee, right? So what we do, watch. Even though you can't get rid of the things that you see, the beauty of what Jesus does is he not only forgives your sin, but in forgiving your sin, he is able to purify your mind and dampen down 
I can't forget everything that I've seen, but what he does is he goes, you're, you're forgiven of that. And I no longer carry the guilt around for the things that I wish that I had never, had never had, I had to process. I wish I never had to do that. But because I did, the beauty of the gospel is that Jesus doesn't go, you're a perverted mess. Get out of, get out of here. You know what Jesus does? He goes, you're a perverted mess. Let me take you. I'm going to clean you up. I'm going to wash you off. We're going to purify your mind. And you're going to be able to have a correct sex life from now on. That's the beauty of what God does, right? No one else can do that. Only Jesus can, can purify your mind so you can have a correct sex life. Watch this. Pure. Sex is not dirty, gross, or wrong. I, I love sometimes when you, you're talking about these things and, you know, it's, it's usually like young ladies or whatever, uh, you know, and they're like, oh, they start like they're electrocuted. It's like, I can't talk about that. It's so gross or whatever. Hey, hey. Sex inside of marriage the way God intended it, it's so beautiful. It's a beautiful connection between men and women. It's just that men and women have created it, uh, treated it poorly. Your sex life is pure when you have the power of God over it. It's pure. God, only God can make the well that we have poisoned pure again. Right? Right? Many of us, it's like a well in the ground that, ha- that used to have pure water, and we've just thrown pornography and just, and just junk in it. We've just shoved just poison down in this, in this well, and we don't even want to drink out of our own well anymore because it's so disgusting. And we're like, I don't even like to have sex. I don't even want to have sex anymore. It's just like, blah, blah. We make up all these excuses. The reality is, when you come into a, a correct knowledge of how God built your sexuality, you are able to have now a correct view of sex, one, like we're talking about this morning, and two, you're able to have the correct heart for sex because God will purify your mind, purify your heart, regardless of what has happened in the past. Not that it does, it, does away with it, but what I'm saying is your own heart can be healed. Your own mind can be healed. God takes the poison that we've dumped in our own well and he purifies this well so that when we pull water up, we go, this is satisfying. This is pure. I can drink this water. Isn't that amazing? Only God can heal those things. Sex is not dirty, gross, or wrong, but it's holy and blessed by God, and there are no restrictions on spouses within biblical boundaries and each other's conscience. You ready? I'm going to get really real for a second. So if you're listening to this on the internet or in a van somewhere with your kids, you might want to mute. There is no boundaries for married men and women inside their bedroom. Not positions, not um, toys that you want to bring in. There is nothing biblically that as long as it's between the two of you and it doesn't violate biblical boundaries or your conscience, you have carte blanche. Again, when you're together in your bedroom in the privacy of your own room, as long as it doesn't violate scripture, as long as it doesn't violate your conscience, what the Holy Spirit tells you, you go crazy. Have some fun. Nobody's with me. Okay, good. Five people are with me. Okay. You're like, I really don't care about that. Okay, I, fine. I don't care. That's, that's awesome. Listen, here's my point. When you're alone with your spouse in your bedroom, it's pure. It's pure. It's pure. It's pure. It's pure. Your past sexual history, it might not have been pure. But what I'm saying is with God's help, the sex moving forward can be totally pure. It can be totally pure. There's nothing you can't do in your bedroom as long as it's with you and your spouse. It's pure. It's pre-sin Eden. Let's get it on. (laughs) Hey, God's own words, but my interpretation. The purity of marriage... Let spouses enjoy each other's bodies freely with no regret. Uh, Song of Solomon chapter 5. Song of Solomon chapter 5 verse 10. This is actually her describing him now. I love how the the, the coin flips over. So we taught, we we saw how she described, he describes her. Now watch how he, uh, she describes him. Verse 10, 5 verse 10. My beloved is radiant and ruddy. I love this picture. It's like a man walking, it's like a movie. Like that slow motion like this. It's like she has this picture of him, like this Brad Pittish thing or whatever's going on here. And it's like this, he's radiant. It's like the sun shining off him. I wish I had some sun like this. 
this, it's like he's radiant and ruddy. It means like healthy. It means like ruddy means like to, to have blood coursing through you, like you're, you're alive. Oh, wow, I like that. My beloved is radiant and ruddy, distinguished among 10,000. So if there's 10,000 guys standing out there, he's like the shining guy. That's the way she's viewing him. His head is of the finest gold. His locks are wavy, black as a raven. So she's describing the color of Middle Eastern uh, men's hair. His eyes are like doves beside streams of water bathed in milk. So the whiteness of his eyes sitting beside a full pool. His cheeks are like beds of spices, mounds of sweet-smelling herbs. His lips are like lilies dripping with liquid myrrh. And that's like the ancient view of just like, it's like honey running off his lips. I can't wait to kiss those babies. (laughs) Verse 14, his arms are like rods of gold. If I had shorter sleeves on, I'd show you the guns this morning that I'm trying to, (laughs) they're hidden behind the shirt. It's like she's describing him. His arms are like rods of gold. Set with jewels. His body is polished ivory, bedecked with sapphires. I want want to be really gentle as I speak of this, uh, as she's working her way down his body. Um, This has one of two translations. And it has the translation of, it's actually a, an elephant tusk made out of ivory. ivory. Uh, and so it's either his carved body or it's the lower anatomy that she is viewing and saying, that's awesome, okay? And most of your translations say it's his body. However, she's moving her way down his body and there's never a translation that talks about a body being car- of carved ivory. Okay, verse 14. Uh, Verse 15, his legs, so now she's working her way south. His legs are like alabaster columns. It's like those columns that you see in Greece with these big beefy columns that are holding up this, uh, this roof. His legs are alabaster columns set on bases of gold. His appearance is like Lebanon, choice is the cedars. So it's this, it's this like masculine, she just loves the masculinity of him. Like he's like a cedar, like these big, huge, massive cedars standing in a, in a forest with all these little puny little shrubs. <laughs> Verse 16, his mouth is most sweet and he is altogether desirable. And I love this last part. She says, this is my beloved and this is my friend. Oh, daughters of Jerusalem. Isn't that beautiful? When the, the person that you get to have sex with actually is your friend. Isn't that awesome? The way marriage is supposed to work is that when you, you get to have sex with your best friend, isn't that awesome? Five people are into it. I'm just so amazed. It's like, it's like here's the way marriage should be, okay? This is the way marriage should be. And it, most of our marriages are not this way, okay? So this is why we're going through this series, because we at least want to see, okay, that's my goal. My marriage, my marriage isn't this way right now, but I'm gonna, that's my goal is what I want it to be, right? So this isn't a guilt trip. I'm not pointing at you and going, your marriage is messed up. What I'm saying is, as we move forward, this is the way we want our marriage to be, correct? This is where we're going. This is where we're heading. So it's not about guilt. It's about saying, that's our goal. Let's go get it. Ideally, you want your spouse to be your best friend. My husband. I love sharing my heart with my husband. And I love his arms of solid gold. Okay. Christians have the best of both worlds. They get to enjoy marital bliss and their sex life is sanctified by the Holy Spirit. This is so beautiful, especially for Christians. I love the fact that the Holy Spirit blesses your sex life. The Holy Spirit's inside of you. It's going to kind of trip you out, but when you have sex with your husband or your spouse, uh, when you have sex with your husband or your wife, the Holy Spirit actually blesses that union. For Christians, sex is worship to God as Jesus is Lord over everything, including the bedroom. Does it ever kind of weird you out that Jesus is Lord of your bedroom as well? (laughs) You know what's funny? It's kind of in our heads. We go, as we shut the bedroom door, we kind of go, not even Jesus can get in here. (laughs) Everything I do in here is all on the down low. Totally secret. Not even Jesus can see behind the door. You know, like Jesus standing outside going, sure would like to know what's going on in there. I hope it's nothing bad. <laughs> Open this door right now. He's not some like weird parent. You know, it's like, 
I don't have the key to this door. Somebody let me in, because I have a feeling there's bad things going on behind this door. Jesus is not some dysfunctional, unattached parent. Jesus is God. He sees everything. He knows everything. Inside your bedroom, he will bless your sex life because it is pure if you've done it God's way. And if it's not pure because you haven't done it God's way, the beauty of the gospel is he forgives your sin, and it's if, you, if you move forward with him, you can have an amazing sex life. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. Only God can heal those things, the wounds of our past, the perversions of our past. God can heal those things and move us forward in purity. You're not consigned to, to, to the future that you built with your past. Lastly, it's special, it's good, it's pure, and it's fulfilling. A sex life should have life. <laughs> does your sex life have life this morning? Is it verdant? Is it alive? Good sex does not start in the bedroom, but in the headroom. Who you think about is who you'll please, and each spouse should seek to serve the other. Let me give you a sexual, some sexual encouragement from a spiritual reality. You are to serve others, right? You're to serve others, Correct. When you follow Jesus, your command is to serve others over yourself, right? You die to self to serve someone else. Not, that should never be more true than in your marriage. If you will not serve your spouse, then why the heck are you letting your spouse be outside God's command to serve someone else? In other words, your sex life isn't even about yourself, right? Right? Am I speaking in, in Braille? Okay. Right. So here's the thing. And here's my whole point this morning. We don't take our sex life and put it in a special category and go, this is outside of spirituality. It's actually within it. Who you think about is who you'll please, and each spouse should seek to serve the other. Sex was not designed to be frustrating, but rather fulfilling, as both spouses are called to fill each other's sexual desires to the best of their ability. There are no headaches in the Christian marriage. Okay. This is, these, are your, these are your answers. Ready? This is, this is a Christian marriage. There are no headaches in the Christian marriage. You know what there is in the Christian marriage? There's either yes or yes, wait. So it's yes either way, but the only other option is wait. Like, my arm fell off today and I need to go get it reattached. And so when that thing's healed, it'll be great. Okay? There should not be this, this weird, um, you know, only on birthdays and Christmas or whatever. Okay? Your sex life is meant to be gorged upon. It should not, it's not for special occasions. It's not special china you pull out for Thanksgiving. <laughs> oh, I love Jesus. Okay. There are no headaches in the Christian marriage. Only yes or yes but wait, and the wait should turn into yes quickly. Abstinence before marriage is commanded. Abstinence after marriage is condemned. And spouses should stop ripping each other off. I wish I had time to go into 1 Corinthians 7, verses 1 through 7. But he, he uses the Greek word aposterio, which means to, to deprive or defraud. Your sex life actually doesn't belong to you. Watch this. You are an actual gift to your spouse sexually. You are a gift. When you say, no, 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 no. Sex tonight? Nope. Sex tonight? Nope. Sex tonight? Nope. Is it Christmas? No. Is it Thanksgiving? No. When you do that, you're actually ripping your spouse off. What you do is you set your spouse up for sexual immorality. Because if they can't drink out of their own well at home, where are they going to drink? Right? The problem is men and women are very different. Women's sexuality has been built by God much like a slow cooker. where you turn it on and it takes a while to warm up. Over, if you give it some time, it's gonna be hot. Oh, I'm gonna get fired, okay, awesome. Okay, watch. I'm almost done, I'm almost done, okay? Okay, here's the thing, women are not built like men. They're chemically different, they're physiologically different, they're emotionally different. Women are just different, but they're different by God's design. Okay? Your wife is not some cold fish or whatever. What she needs is you to be a better lover. Women are responders, they're not aggressors. 
Women aren't responders. They're built to respond. They're not built to be aggressors. So when this thing's ready and hot, it's going to be great. But before it gets there, it's kind of cold. Men, however, are a little different. Men are more like a microwave. Men, men are turned on quickly, and they heat up quickly. So, watch this. Here's the way God designed your sex life to be fulfilling, okay? And I'll be done. I'm going to wrap this up. Watch. So, how can these two coexist? Well, they get the same job done. They just get it done at different time frames, okay? So, whether you are an instant turn on and get that job done the way you're designed, or whether it takes you a little bit longer, but the job still gets done. Watch. As a spouse, as a spouse, you must understand the way God built. God did not build men and women to be instantly turned on, sex is over in uh, two minutes. God did not design men and women to be together, so it takes uh, a longer amount of time <laughs> to... So watch. So God has this ingenious design. He builds men and women different so that sex doesn't become mechanical and just like uh, a, a thing that you just have to get, be done with. And God doesn't design it so that, wow, it almost never happens because it doesn't, there's no passion there, okay, because it takes forever to get going. God designs this so that when both people want to serve one another, it's this beautiful synthesis where the man leads like he's supposed to be leading his house. He leads his wife. He brings her along in her sexual excitement to the point where she is, she is fulfilled, he is fulfilled, and they find their fulfillment in their design. Isn't that amazing? Rather than going, he was always pawing at me. I hate that. He's always just, he's like this wild animal. She's like this cold fish that's dead laying on the beach. And there's like, no, here's the thing. You've misunderstood God's design. You've misunderstood God's design. Because it always can't be about the way you want it to be. And it always can't be about the way you want it to be. Inside, there's this beautiful synthesis. where when they come together, everybody gets what they need. And everybody's fulfilled. But she must understand him and serve him. And he must understand her and serve her. When both are serving the way Jesus calls us to serve, then everybody's fulfilled. Though spouses may have different libidos or sex drive, biblical sex is always consensual and servant-oriented and is not something that should be demanded but rather willingly offered. Married sex is the best sex as it should strive to be fun, frequent, flirty, fervent, and fulfilling. Isn't that beautiful? Your sex life can be amazing. Your sex life can be amazing. But you must work to have Jesus who built it as Lord over it. And then in that way, we are all fulfilled in our marital covenants to one another.